penetrate those who have um what is it's like um a hard to break mentality um within my own mother uh, during ramadan who was my biggest supporter and you know okay. it it's actually kind of fascinating because he would ask me questions about the Quran instead of listening to music, I would listen to it out loud while I was cleaning. And then he'd be like, oh, um, ask me a biblical question. And then I would answer it in, in a way that the Quran had spoke to me. And that kind of back and forth between us made me realize that Islam isn't forcing anybody to understand. Um, it's teaching, it's knowledge. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. The, the the wisdom of the the Quran being revealed over several several years and like um, for those of you guys who aren't familiar right with the process in which the Quran was revealed you have Mecki surahs and Madani surahs so surahs of the Quran that were I'm gonna mute um you Brian I think there might be some feedback okay there we go there are Mecki surahs Madani surahs so basically. If you, I think, I think someone's giving a little feedback. If you guys don't mind muting yourselves in the meantime, just so you don't have any feedback. Does that come up? Check it one more time, would you please? What is it? More? Uh, go ahead and check one more time. Sorry, I think it, it could be because of the multi-stream. If it's given too much trouble. Then... Oh no, it's okay. No, yeah, yeah, it's, I, I think it's sounding okay. Does that come up? Okay. So Meccan surahs, Madani surahs. Meccan surahs are surahs that were revealed, as the name implies, in Mecca. Uh, the Madani surahs were revealed in Medina. But there's a distinct difference between these surahs and in certain trends that they follow. Um, in Mecca, which is the place in which the Prophet A.S. first reveals, uh, receives revelation, and Islam is completely new, right, to in, in terms of uh, the, the, the basic tenets and understanding, you know, were there through previous prophets, but in the way that it is now being presented, codified as a religion, all of these new um, mandates are, are being presented in Mecca. And how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decide that we are best to learn being? He starts with teaching our faith, theology. We learn in, in Meccan surahs who's God. Um, we learn about hell, we learn about heaven, we learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qualities, we learn about other, we learn about these principles of deen. And, mm -hmm. you know, Brianna, you're, you're reminding me of this because you, you said it in yourself, right? There are certain aspects of Islam that lure people just because it just speaks to the heart so deeply. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's these principles, right? And then it is in Medina where we see most of the rulings around, you know, um, marriage and hijab and, and, you know, certain aspects of, um, of, of uh, you know, inheritance, certain actual legal rulings and fiqh, often um, that's where we, a lot of the chapters of the Quran that speak about that come in. So there's there's a very profound wisdom that scholars talk about. When we start doing da'wah, where the first thing we want to do is really talking, hey, make sure you're doing this and avoiding this. And even by the Shu'ayb, we talked about how haram lured you into Islam or haram brought you to Islam, subhanAllah. Um, in the sense of that's the, the first introduction you had. If someone came to you and started screaming in your face, why are you smoking? You know, this is this is not what a Muslim should do. That's not how people learn. That's not how we grow into the um, Brother Morris, you are up next. In yes, subhanAllah. So um, my uh, story is also just a little bit unique. Uh, so obviously as an atheist, I was like, oh, you know, there's, no, nothing else but this, and I was very materialistic. Were you? Were you I'm so sorry to interrupt. But were you like a, a neo? Like, what, what? Were you the one? Were you the ones on like Instagram or YouTube telling everyone else they're stupid for? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> alhamdulillah, <laughs> I was protected from that. Alhamdulillah, I kept my stupidity to myself. I was pretty good at that. <laughs> um, but what? What? I mean, the the small sphere of influence that I had, of course, you know, like I would. I would talk to them and, and when they would say like, oh yeah, you know, I believe in God. And I'm just like, okay, man. Yeah. You just like talk to imaginary creatures too, you know? So it was like that. Right. But those are my uh, hardcore J days as I like to call them. Um, now on that same token, what happened with me was, uh, so I ended up having a, a shard of glass go through my wrist right here and um, it lacerated a major artery. Right. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, uh, uh, oh my God, <laughs> like I'm going to die. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I basically, it was a very unique circumstance where um, I was at home 
And for no reason whatsoever, my uncle, who was within proximity to my house at the time, um, he was he came over and decided to take a shower after work. So he he works with a lot of like uh, he works kind of in a paint shop with a lot of um, just a lot of chemicals and parts and stuff like that. And he decided to come over uh, for to, to shower up. And I was like, yeah, sure, you know, go ahead, do your thing. And then a, a glass vase ended up falling over and um, uh, it lacerated the artery. And I was like, oh, man, like, this is crazy. Like, I, you, like, the taste of metal started coming into my mouth. I mean, it literally was like you turn your faucet on. So there's one that's like, you know, you from a medical background, there's one that's like a pumper. And then there's another one that's just like <laughs> a gusher. Your arteries, yeah. Your arteries, if you lacerate, and I mean, arteries are pretty difficult to lacerate too. You have to go in pretty deep to be able to do that. But, for those who are watching and don't kind of understand, arteries are your pumpers. They are literally taking blood um, from your heart to different parts of your body. So there's an immense amount of force. When we see people coming into the ER or the urgent care, they lacerate an artery, you'll see the blood squirting out versus you, if you, you know, if you, if, if it's a vein or a venule, it's just kind of dripping. So yeah and you lose a lot of blood very quickly yeah so this one this one was it was on the return side so it wasn't like you know doing the squirt but it was like like it was going you know so i ended up grabbing a, a tourniquet uh, and i was like tying it with my hand and then i ended up grabbing a, a belt and i also like you know compress you know tied it again there was a lot of pressure on it and i ended up calling 911 and i ended up getting a, a deadline so i was mm -hmm. like uh, what the heck is going on here? Um, ended up calling 911 again, same thing, deadline. My uncle finishes, uh, he's literally just finishing up with the shower, like he dressed and my grandmother was there at the time. So she's screaming, uh, you know, help, help, kind of what's going on. Uh, anyway, I get into the car with him and the whole time I'm thinking to myself, uh, please God, don't take me. And, I, and then I'm like, dude, you're an atheist. Like, what are you talking about? Please, God, don't take me. Like, what is this? You know what I mean? So then I ended up getting to the ER. Um, and, and in the meantime, praying the whole time while I'm, you know, just please get me pulled over so I can get some type of, uh, you know, escort or something like that, right? Hoping to get, you know, uh, pulled over. And we're blasting through red lights. I mean, it was, it was pretty wild. So then get to the ER. And you know how there's... Um, Usually, like, there's those folks that are just, like, calling out sick from work. <laughs> and then there's me just, like, covered in blood everything. You know, you think it was, like, a, you know, a murder scene or something, right? Get to the ER. Um, the trauma surgeon at the time, uh, the patient before me passed away. So he, he went out. And I'm thinking to myself, man, all these odds are happening. Like, all these things are stacking up, right? Mm -hmm. So then they put me on the bed. Um, and I've got uh, a nurse, they put a, the, the, uh, blood pressure cuff and they put that like to some super high pressure amount. They got, they had a nurse, uh, putting additional weight and, you know, mashallah, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her. She was a, a little heavier set. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, dude, my arm is about to fall off. My arm was under pressure for no joke about five hours. It was like as black as like the back of that flag. And I'm thinking to myself, this is insane. So my mother, she was in a little bit in the medical field and she ended up calling a, a surgeon of hers to come by and just make sure everything's going okay. So they threatened a lawsuit on the trauma surgeon to come back to examine my wrist to make sure there was no additional shards of glass in there. And then um, the first thing that my my mother and the surgeon asked was why why are his, his hands not clamped why why didn't we clamp the vein and uh, or the artery and let it you know restore blood flow and they had me on Riglin they had me on all sorts of stuff you know just for pain medication and so on and let me tell you something when they release the pressure of that um, the, the the cuffs and everything that was there. I have never felt pain like that in my life because the blood flow restores, but it literally feels like you just thrown your arm over a barbecue and it just, it is excruciating. But the, the doctor said, if we would have kept it at about six hours, they, they would have just cut my arm off because it's, it's just no good. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually shocked that that was the approach taken, but 
Yeah, it was, it's and I've got photographs. I got it. So there's a full memory on it. Okay, but then the whole time I'm thinking to myself, like, dude, you're sitting over here praying to God, to God, the magic, you know, man in the sky or what have you, right? That you kept making fun of, you know, stuff for the law. And um, I'm thinking to myself, like, how is that so? How is it that all these things lined up? And then when it came to a critical junction, all of a sudden, you know, so then that kind of sparked my curiosity. Why did I pick a slam over anything else to get back to the root of the questions that can go on forever? I started looking at things objectively and I started saying, like, okay, what actually makes sense? I put up criteria. So I said, I'm not going to look at people, no microcosms of society, no events, nothing like that. I'm just going to take a look at the scriptures. And when I started reading the scriptures, so I, you know, I have my MacArthur Study Bible. Um, I had uh, I had taken a look at segments of the Bhagavad Gita. I had taken a look at um, you know some of the teachings of Buddhism. I had taken a look at uh, you know the Quran. And the only thing that withstood the test was the Quran, meaning like the things that it was saying to me was innate. It was innate that there can only be one God. It was innate that God wouldn't have any type of offspring or any type of partnership and so on. So when I started and, and, and still till this day, you know, alhamdulillah, it's not so much about having doubts, but it's more so just curiosity of like when the Quran says, you know, challenge me, challenge this book. It's making a claim that this is there's no doubt in this book. And any time that you bring a sincere heart to it and your your quest for truth is there, alhamdulillah, Islam is the only religion that has all of the answers. So it didn't Christianity didn't make sense to me. Atheism didn't make sense to me. Buddhism didn't make sense to me. Um, you know, all, all these, uh, you know, and I had to look at it categorically because I'm not going to sit here and spend, you know, who's going to spend a, a lifetime studying 8,000 religions to come to a conclusion? Like, forget it. There's no way, right? There's not enough time. So, um, yeah, I, that, that's, that was the biggest factor as to why I chose this time. Every single time that I would have a question, there was a nice detailed answer that was filled with just knowledge and wisdom and truth. So, you know, um, yeah, you just keep putting it to the test like like I I did. And alhamdulillah, it just keeps reigning supreme. And here I am. So your fifth that I kicked in, your that I was like, yeah, you know, leading out. I mean, it, it, and this is such an often, uh, yeah. often mentioned experience with a lot of people I know who've come to Islam is you have some sort of near death experience that really challenges. OK, if you were to leave this world with what you believed in that moment, would you be okay with that? And it's almost like your that I was like, no, don't do that to yourself, subhanAllah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so JazakAllah for sharing that. And I'm also sorry that you had to experience such horrible medical care because that's appalling. Um, I'm shocked that, I mean, I, so I work urgent care. I have people coming in bleeding like crazy. All the yeah. Time. You know, we, 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 we handle it. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's nerve wracking. Brianna, I know you had to leave. Um, if there's anything you want to share before you hop off, Please feel free to otherwise give your salam and inshallah will at least what you've been able to share people will benefit from. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This is truly um alhamdulillah the best opportunity that I could have been um present in. I appreciate everybody for sharing their stories. I'm definitely gonna watch the stream back. So whatever you say, you know, I'm definitely gonna be in tune with y'all. Um I wanna say Maris. I'm glad you're here. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I have a similar story of, you know, uh, of when I was down a bad road. Uh, I, SubhanAllah, I'm still here and able to breathe and communicate with you all. Um, before I leave, I just wanted to say, each and every one of you, kind of included, um, may Allah reward you all for your good deeds. And I hope that everybody, mashallah, has a great rest of the year. You know, it started off great and we're gonna end up watching, you know, so, some miraculous things happen this year. So just oh, no. keep fighting, keep fighting. And I believe in every one of you. So thank you for having me. Um Asalaamu Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum, take care. All right, guys. Awesome. Bismillah. Okay, so again, we have some new people tuning in. If you are just tuning in, please drop in the comments where you are watching from. Um, share, inshallah, we do have I, an international audience. So I have some questions that I, I, I wanted. I, I, okay, I have an interesting question for you guys. and It's going to be a short answer and we'll jump from there. I want to know from your perspective, 
what do you think is the greatest, in your opinion, social ill or social calamity, however you want to define it, mm. that humans uh, are facing today? Mm. Like, if you had to say, like, this is the biggest problem, we need to put all of our, our, our focus on this issue, what would that be for you? Mm. Let's do that one. I'm going to add a, I'm going to add a second question. That's People equal. in the West. Uh, so first is everyone, other people in the West. Sure. Uh, anybody that wants to jump on, feel free. Baddle, Morris, Baddle. Okay. Yeah, uh, so I would say the, the biggest thing is misinformation. Um, and uh, the reason why I say that is because um, people are, uh, like, here's an example. You know, last night, I, uh, you know, subhanAllah, I hate TikTok. You know, uh, I, I hate it because um, it, it leads to this type of uh, lack of like depth in conversations and people are there. Everybody now all of a sudden has an opinion. Everybody's a scholar. Everybody's this, you know, and, and they're just like the go to. And even the thing that it did to me the most was destroy social currency. It has commercialized social currency for me. And it is, it's something where like, when you used to make a, a deal with somebody, when you would tell somebody your word and the integrity that um, you had, all of that stuff is now destroyed for the purposes of like clout or for selling a product or service or something like that. And to me, that's just a, a massively destructive to society. So, you know, SubhanAllah, I was on last night and, uh, you know, just you're, you're browsing and there's different um, channels of apologetics and so on. And came across a, a Christian channel. It's just two uh, young brothers, right? And um, brothers in humanity, that is. And they're talking about how Islam is false and they're posing these questions. Then all of a sudden, uh, a young Muslim brother, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to guide him, you know, pops on there and tries to answer some of these questions to the best of his abilities, but you can tell that he's not upon knowledge. And now they're having this exchange. And there's this massive misinformation happening. And when I popped on there to correct these two uh, Christian brothers, their lack of willingness to learn just for the sake of ego and self-preservation was just, it's, it's telling of what TikTok is doing to people and what um, this uh, age of misinformation is happening, this information overload, right? All of a sudden you read one little snippet here or there and you think you're just a, a student of knowledge. And then you walk up there and he goes, you know, hey, Dawa, are you are you Islam? And I go, yeah, yes, I'm a Muslim. And now all of a sudden, this guy's supposed to teach me Islam. This guy's supposed to tell me about Quran. This guy who doesn't, you know, understand a lick of Arabic or didn't take, you know. And, and now I ask him, hey, where are you getting your information from? Oh, I've done lots of deep studies and I talk to Muslim friends and stuff like that. And I said, okay, just give me one source of somebody that you've read. Just give me one book, one author, one nothing. Just absolute nothing. So I think that this is a plague. And I think if people are genuinely seeking truth and they want to be upon that truth, that you've got to take the proper channels, but be real with yourself. Be real with yourself to say, I don't know certain things, but I'm willing to find out and I'm, and I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to ask questions and face the realities that uh, my own ignorance can lead to my demise, right? Because just like you had mentioned, in the same way that the Sahaba and the Prophet salam, boosted people's Iman first, he didn't walk into a place and said, you need to put on a hijab, immediately stop drinking, all this, is, this, this and that, right? These uh, immediate rigid things uh, that our stern, Islam is stern on, right? You have to build people's Iman up to understand that there was an afterlife and then they submitted to not drinking because they were more interested in Jannah than they were in alcohol. So this is the approach, the proper approach in Dawah. Why is it that, that the people of Medina, when they heard the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ wasn't even there yet, but why is it that they were willing to adjust their ways? Why is it that they are willing to abandon these uh, silly practices of child burial and uh, all this other stuff? Why? Because they fell in love with what the message was they fell in love with the Quran. They saw the walking Quran, and then they, they submitted the rest, right? So in this same nature, when you're talking to people about this information, especially hot topics, you know, 
uh, and they don't know anything and they're not willing to learn, now you have an attestation of what their character is. And this is Shaitan feeding into this and, and further leading to their heart being closed. So this is, you know, that to me is what I think is, is the biggest issue. This misinformation and then not actually uh, wanting to rid yourself of that problem. Rather just falling in line and, and you know, carrying on for the purposes of self-clout and whatever. SubhanAllah, you took the words out of my mouth because this has been something I've been complaining about so much when it comes to TikTok. I know you're speaking about people in general on TikTok. My biggest uh, issue is TikTok Muslims. And I think, I, I'm sure you guys have seen this. People watching live, if you're on TikTok, you'll regularly come across Muslims who are, you know, attempting to share deen, but they're doing it in a way that is very aggressive, very emotionally unregulated, very much focused on hostility and in, in, uh, clickbait um, and anger, right? How often I'll come, there's one specific person, I, I, I'm just holding back on, on saying the, his username, who every single video is a picture or someone being called out. And, and it's like, that's not how you correct someone. That's not how you do da'wah. Mm -hmm. And I think in line with what you're saying, Brother Morris is, uh, the Prophet was not, first of all, just students of knowledge, let's step back from the Prophet for a second. When students of knowledge are studying under scholars of our deen, and scholars are the inheritors of the Prophet, right? They go through rigorous study to be able to teach us what they know and to do the work that ensures that we are able to, to actually understand the complexities of deen that often we wouldn't be able to without, without them. The first thing you learn as a student of knowledge is not Quran, is not Tariq, is not Hadith, is not Tafsir, it is Adab, mm -hmm. it is character, it is mm -hmm. how do you interact, How what is the Adab of taking in knowledge, what is the Adab with scholars, prof, like profoundly well-known scholars of our past, when they met each other in a debate, it's funny because people who now say I adopt the school of thought of this scholar <laughs> will argue and fight to the death with another student of knowledge from another school of thought. But those scholars themselves who we attribute to certain schools of thought, whether it's fiqh or, or otherwise, could sit with one another and respect you guys. You are trying to do work for the dean. Mm -hmm. That is non-existent. The lack of character, I think, is one of the most, uh, it, it is, it is, the murdering of our soul mm -hmm. when we relinquish character and we allow ourselves to be un emotionally unregulated unre the one thing islam gives us islam gives us so many things but the one thing that is so hard to mimic in other channels mm -hmm. is the level of character right subhanallah and and i'll, I'll say this so then i'll jump to um brother shuaib inshallah is that uh, uh the the way the sahaba the way the muslims and the, the sahaba you know the male and the female submitted to islam the how how incredible it was it was to the extent of they had seen the character of the prophet islam they saw the influence impact impact he had on other people subhanallah um i think we might have lost rosie or she probably helped out for a second rosie we lost her image if you're still there um but subhanallah there would be verses that would be revealed. And at this time, just like you said, Brother uh, Morris, the Iman was so built up that the moment those verses were revealed, the Muslims submitted. Example, when it came to the verses outlawing alcohol, and this was a community that drank very heavily. Mm -hmm. I mean, like it was... 13 years. Yeah. What is it? What did you say? It took 13 years for them, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, you know, make it yeah. haram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, subhanAllah. It's, it, it was a community that... I mean, it was alcohol was extremely social and a part of their cultural practices. Muslims hear that it is no longer allowed, and what do you what do they describe? The 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 rivers, literally the, the streets were flowing because people just took it and dumped it. That's all it took. Allah said it was no longer allowed. Halas were done in Medina. When so many of you guys might not be familiar with this um, who are watching, but Subhanallah, the Original Qibla, when Muslims uh, of the Prophet's time were actually praying towards Mecca. Originally, they were praying in the direction of Jerusalem. And this was actually the same direction that the Jews or the Jewish tribes uh, prayed to. And there comes a point, and there, the verses can be found in the Quran, in which Allah SWT distinguishes the Muslim by switching the Qibla, right? And now you are praying there, we, are, we pray in the direction of uh, the Kaaba. 
And there's a beautiful, I mean, if you look at the TIFF seed and the verses are extremely beautiful. Some scholars say that part of the reason why that Qibla was shifted is because Allah, the Prophet ﷺ had such a love and care and he was missing Mecca so much. Mm -hmm. But in that instant, there was there was a specific instance in which Sahaba were praying and they were still praying towards what was formerly the Qibla of Jerusalem. And someone walked by and recited to them the new verses that had been revealed that have changed the Qibla. And in their Salah, what did they do? They, they turned and they started facing the new Qibla. And members of the Jewish tribe saw that and started mocking them, laughing. Your God couldn't, couldn't decide which one he wanted. That demoralization, right? And it's what we see all the time. You go on TikTok, how many people are just so vile and hateful towards Muslims? I was laughing. I messaged my friend the other day and I was like, I forgot sometimes, I forget sometimes how much people hate Muslims when you hear the things. <laughs> there's a, there was like a news article about shitty, like compliant mortgages or something. And people like in the comments blowing up, like, we don't need Sharia law. Why did they get special treatment? And now there's halal meat at Costco. And I was like, Jesus Louise, like, you can get your toxic hormone filled me if you want me to you'll be okay <laughs> well, subhanallah yeah so i believe i i so strongly resonate with that jazakallah my brother um uh morris for that brother Shabai, please please share inshallah what you're yeah um i would like to piggyback off of what morris said with the, i don't think people have an excuse with the misinformation now because there's so much information so it's like like a click away you know what i'm saying you can't if you need the scholars they had to get on a donkey and and travel for mm -hmm. days just to get one hadith. Now we got one click. So I think it's based on who people are choosing to watch. And the, when I first got into the Islam and I started to get deep into it, I think that a lot of people that are aggressive, myself was included, and we're coming from the streets. So a lot of people that you see, mm -hmm. and this is not to, um, they gotta be held accountable because um, the way we give dawah is, is a specific way, but I remember I was so like, you know, when you first get that, that, that iman, you want everybody to have it. And, you know, we have wisdom in Islam, like putting everything in its proper place. So as a youth coming from the streets, coming from a gang, I was giving the people Islam just the way, like I was gangbanging, because I didn't have that 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 wisdom. So it's probably the same situation with these guys on TikTok and YouTube. They're just going so hard because they have a love. They might be sincere, but they don't really know how to give the um, and that mm -hmm. takes that takes time. Like you see somebody smoking, I used in prison when I, I became the imam in prison before you know. And that's that's a that's a wild statement, brother Shai. And I was giving the, I was I was the one in charge of giving the chutzpah. So, you know, I'm 22, and I'm seeing guys on the walkway smoking, and you know, I'm snatching cigarettes out people's head. So, I was, you know, in that zone, and people like I'm old enough to be your father, and you know, it's like a beef with me and the Muslims. Like nobody likes the imam. I got a couple of brothers that that wouldn't be around me, that's because I didn't have the hikma of knowing how to give the dawah. Um, but the social illness for me is like the lack of manhood. It's like we have men, but we don't have men, mm -hmm. you know, and morality. So like whether you're a Christian, a Jew, or a, or a Muslim, the reason why the society is the way it is because we, we, we lack men and we lack morality because mm -hmm. Um, we know everybody is not going to be a Muslim, but there is a there's people that you meet that's non-Muslim, and you say, "Man, you are you have the characteristics. You would make a a beautiful Muslim." Mm -hmm. So I think that if people were more had more morality and we had more men, and I'm not saying women are a vital role to the society, but I I notice the stronger the men are, is the stronger the women are. Mm -hmm. You know in the society so i think that's one of the serious issues that we have is we just lack men and morality you know um in my opinion you know and it's it's it's, it's serious and i think you know i mean if we had more men and more morality then things would be better off you know i agree 100 percent brother Shai. uh it, to be i'm going to piggyback off the aggressive side of things 
I I love the example you gave because it reminds me of even just the fact that the Prophet ﷺ altered the his da'wah method depending on who he was speaking to, right? Mm -hmm. When he was yeah. speaking to elites of Mecca, it looked uh, different. When he was speaking to the Sahaba of, of uh, Mecca and the Amsad of Medina, it was different. When he was speaking to the Bedouins, it was different, mm -hmm. right? So it definitely can understand kind of what where you're coming from. I think my plight is the fact that I know these, they're not gangbanging. They're just, you know, 20-something-year-olds, <laughs> yeah. yeah. a and, software engineering degree sitting in his mom's, yeah. uh, in a bedroom in his yeah. mom's and house. You have, and <laughs> have you ever thought about, like, some hadith with Umar? You would hear, oh, Umar knocked him on his back and drug him to the Prophet for the law and he would tell him about one leg. So you like, you know, so some people read that and be like, oh, yes, I'm going to be Umar. You know, and they just, they just take it the, you know, the wrong way. So may Allah mm -hmm. give us hikmah. Um, yeah. You know, it would be a super cool project. I think about this all the time. Brother Morris movie, this is about to be yours. It's like, you know, with the psychology background. But there is personality psychology, and there's a lot of research on this, right? Even if you think about like the ocean assessment, uh, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, assertiveness, neuroticism, it's like different aspects of personality. We know certain aspects of personality are actually um, genetically influenced. Mm -hmm. If someone ever did an analysis of different Sahaba and their personality types specific to you know the, uh, the actual measures we have, I think it would be so powerful and interesting because I used to always think about this, the fact that you know, we had Umar who very much, I mean, he was high in assertiveness, right? But he played a certain role. You have people like Abu Bakr who was extremely diplomatic. He was extremely, I mean, it, 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 when when Umar is angry, we're like, yeah, okay, it makes sense, right? That was just, but yeah. when Abu Bakr got angry, if you read it, you read of the narrations about what anger, you're kind of taken aback, like, oh, so this must have been bad, right? And all the Sahab, you know, the Sahaba and Sahaba, the Sahabiyah, have such distinct personalities. And it is a reflection of the fact that you can come with your superpowers, you can come with the characteristics that you have, what makes you unique, and you can be a, a, a pillar of the deep, right? No, no matter where you are, whether it's you, you came from gangbanging or you are you know coming into a situation where you, you know, a software engineer living in his mama, uh, mama's uh, 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 house, there's a way to a way to do it and connect with the people and just like the prophets other than the prophet muhammad sallallahu were sent to the people in the language of their people uh, we recognize that as well and we come to it with wisdom I, I agree um and i'll say this and then jump to rosie inshallah i i'll say this as a woman because it's easier for me to get away with it as a woman than it would be for you brothers but uh, we got to go back to the sunnah and we got to go back to the quran and the reality of it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set out a certain structure in the way that he wants society to operate. And I guess it's been distorted in its understanding in several past decades. But men are the caretakers of women. What has happened, and I'm extremely passionate about this because from the medical side, I've seen what it literally has done physiologically to women. Men are the caretakers of women, and when men relinquish that responsibility, or and or when women attempt to take that responsibility away, we live in chaos. I mean, we are different, and we are different in a way that and the people say this very apologetically. I'm saying we are different, and that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave us strengths that we can harness as women, and gave brothers strengths that they can harness as men, and we are meant to complement and live in this perfect harmony and balance. And when we shift that. You, I mean, you lead to situations of, uh, we're in a situation of the biggest mental health crisis when it comes to men that we have ever seen, highest unaliving rates, highest depression rates, highest drug use rates. It is absolutely ridiculous. And then on the other side of women, the amount of autoimmune conditions that we see, the level of depression, um, the extent of single motherhood, it is not working. We've been sold a lie. And I, I stand very much against it because at the end of the day, you can achieve what was promised, this promise of empowerment and freedom, there are ways to achieve those things mm -hmm. without destroying the fabric of society and leaving women in a situation where now we have to deal with the consequences of this messaging we've been put out to. And I say this as someone, again, I, I, I practice medicine. I, I, you know, I, I don't play the super traditional role, but in my marriage, for example, we play very traditional roles and that, it's almost like the, the natural fitra of of uh, a woman being able to accept that this is someone who cares for her and her, her caregiver. It, it just makes things so, so safe for us. And then we are able to give to our next generation, inshallah. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. And I was going to ask you guys about that, inshallah, actually. So 
um, we'll, we'll mention, I'll, I'll talk more about it inshallah in a bit, but Rosie, share with me what your thoughts are, what is the biggest social ill? Um, so I'm gonna kind of comment on everybody's um, answer, uh, but it's funny because I used to say before, um, I may be Muslim, but I'm still Dominican and my father's daughter, so pray with me, don't play with me. Uh, but it used to be like my whole uh, thing. Um, but I was talking to one of my team members and she always tells me, uh, she's one of my editors, um, it's funny because sometimes I'm very like, kind of passionate about what I'm talking about. And she's, she's always telling me like, maybe you should dial it back a little bit because it seems like you're attacking them. And like, that's not what I, you know, that's not what I want to do. But a lot of the times it's, I get so like upset because I know that I was taught the same thing. And it's like, no, that's not it though. Like if, if you look like, don't, don't just listen to what somebody's telling you, don't just listen to what a pastor might be telling you. Don't just listen to like, actually read, actually go and do your research. Like I get so upset, but it's not <laughs> like, I'm not trying to yell at the people. I'm just upset because I wish everybody could see it the way that Allah has allowed me to see it. And it's, it's to me, it's funny because I, I tend to have a strong personality, but it's not, you know, I'm not trying to be mean or anything to anybody. Um, but then there's also the fact about misinformation. And I completely agree. There's there's so much misinformation out there. Um, and I know right now, like, I'm not a big, this is funny because I'm not a big fan of social media yet. I have like a social media presence. Um, but it's, Social media right now, it's what's getting the word out there because the news no longer um, is, is um, what's the word? Um, it's not reliable. It's not credible anymore. The, the, yeah. news, the, the news yeah. is not reliable anymore. Yeah. And, and now we're able to see, and right now there's the whole like banning TikTok and things. Like I wasn't for TikTok until this whole, like until you've seen all the people that are unite uniting and you know you get to see that on social media people are planning things on social media i'm actually after this live i'm going to the university of texas here in austin um to see what the students need um and i'm gonna go to the store get them whatever <coughs> thinking about texas too actually i love i, I visited it was awesome yeah. yeah. And, but I mean, Rosie, do you mind if I interrupt? Do you mind if I interrupt real quick and just explain what you're talking about for people who are maybe international and aren't familiar? So for those of you guys who aren't familiar with every single everything going on in Gaza, um, and there's there was kind of a summit in terms of progress. We're living in the United States. Our you know uh, representatives are supporting this war and massacre against our brothers and sisters. And students came up with the idea to basically take a tactic that was also used in the 60s and set up in literal encampments on university grounds, right? So they will set up tents and they are basically just staying there um, to make a statement and protest the uh, one Hazza. And so that has been something that has been happening across the country. There has been a substantial police presence on those university campuses arresting students. Um, you know, um, harming, physically harming, assaulting students. And it's, uh, if you, you can check, if you live in the United States, check if there are nearby areas, but you know, there are people like Rosie who are basically supplying food and supply so that they don't have to leave the encampment, encampment and end up possibly not being able to get back in, so. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of schools right now that are also being pepper sprayed and mm -hmm. like all, you see them with gas masks and it's, it's so sad um and i was talking with my husband and he's like oh like what are you gonna do for for mother's day and i was like i'm gonna go to the university of texas and i'm gonna try to supply the students with what they need um as a gift to myself um for mother's day um but yeah i i think there's there's a lot of misinformation there's a lot of just there's a lot of people that are that are ignorant like you're seeing everything right in front of your eyes and and you're still choosing to to support a, a genocide you know like it's 
it, it, to me, I get so upset. I was having a conversation with my dad about this um, because they're like, well, you have to look at both sides. No, there's mm -hmm. there's no looking at both sides anymore. Like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's I, yeah there's it's a couple things. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's, in the, it's not the eyes that are blind, but the heart, right? You can mm -hmm. look at both sides and come to the conclusion that there's no equality in the both sides. You know, one one side has no military. Um, one side has been driven out and made refugees, and then refugees again. Thousands. If you can, uh, uh, the conversation stopped with me at, at killing children. If you can justify killing are children, you? I have no, I, I have no uh, interest in having a further conversation because we we stand on very different places when it comes to how we see humanity. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so a couple things. Um, first off. Uh, what was a shock factor to me was in regards to these institutions and these peaceful protests. Look at, I, I want you guys to really read between the lines as to what's happening. Institutions are what I believe to be the golden goose of the West. And the reason why I say that is because of predatory loan practices. And it, it is a business. So much so that when a professor was recording an event, look at the first tactic that the university took. They didn't say dip anything diplomatic. They immediately resulted to force and arresting the person. Mm -hmm. What that tells you is the actual militarization of universities and where their mentality is at. Meaning mm -hmm. you're pocket checking us you need to be dealt with immediately and with force. The very same institutions that are supposed to be promoting thought and democracy and liberty and so on have immediately resorted to force in the same way of what's happening overseas for many years. So now you're seeing the veil being lifted by a lost paladana and you can see what these people are for the ugliness that they and the, and the ugliness that's in their hearts. They are run by administration and it, it, it's a form of massive indoctrination for the purposes of uh, acquiring a piece of paper right now, albeit some professions I understand, such as the medical profession where you're dealing with anatomy and surgery and so on. But when you're talking about knowledge, it's relatively parallel. There's not something that I can't read that a university can't teach me, but when it comes to things like clinicals and so on, I understand that there's barriers. And, and that's fine, but my point is that these places that are supposed to be freedom of speech immediately silenced speech and took violence. So that's the first thing that I wanna bring your attention to, right? All for the purposes of money, because you're pocket checking. Second thing is in regards to the men being caretakers of women. Who in their right mind would not want the best for their wife? When people hear this stuff, they think that there's some type of, uh, you know, uh, forceful conduct being conducted on a wife. But look, happy wife, happy life, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the way the Prophet ﷺ interacted with Khadija so, so much so that when she passed, right, he would still make sacrifices and distribute the meat in her name and her and, and his current wives would be jealous. This is the type of caretaking that we're talking about, the type of love that uh, we are uh, given as an illustration for our wives. Who, what better way other than Islam can there be to be that type of a caretaker, especially when you know that your accountability is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day. So like, you know, and the reason why I bring that up is because it seems it's a it's a very um, controversial issue, right? Especially that particular verse in the field of da'wah, it's often used against us in, in apologetics, like as if like, oh, you know, the man has authority over the woman. Yeah, absolutely. But look at the way, look at the due process that needs to be taken, right? And then ultimately, it's the man's responsibility of what the outcome is. So it removes an additional burden from his wife, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, and, and I agree to uh, 
everything that was said here, if there, if we followed the process systematically, and if we had honorable people following these processes, and if we did have Sharia instituted, there wouldn't be any predatory loans. There wouldn't be any education for the purposes of milking and 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 um, basically financially imprisoning people. You know what I mean? So th these are my kind of personal reflections on the things that are going on. And in regards to the things that are happening for the genocide, it is point blank obvious. Not And, and uh, although I 100% agree with your guys' stance in regards to children, uh, I would encourage you to uh, be reminded of the Quranic perspective. Child or not, if it's an innocent life, you've killed all of mankind, period. Yeah. So it's like, you know, we have even another degree. So... And at this point, you know, what are we? We're probably about eight months in, probably a little bit more, right? Eight and some change, maybe going on nine months of, of uh, this genocide. If at this point you have not picked up and read a single article about anything, this is, an, again, an attestation of you standing in front of the mirror, right? And when it comes to ignorance, right, it's no longer an excuse. And I'm seeing tons of backlash out there from celebrities being boycotted products being boycotted uh you know all these things and now they're they're trying to stay relevant you know so like my wife and i we were talking on a, on our walk and she was saying like have you noticed that you know justin bieber had uh elected to keep his uh uh pregnancy their pregnancy quiet until he became a little bit more irrelevant and was people were starting to boycott and then all of a sudden they have this look at look at me you know post uh shiny object syndrome of like remember this you know it's like dude you're so not important and the things that you're saying are so not important and there's so many more catastrophes happening right now and the things that are keeping our brains preoccupied uh such as like do we have enough money to pay rent uh food and so on this is a form of squelching happening to the audience I'm not going to get down on that tangent, but, you know, um, subhanAllah, you know, uh, Alam Stan, like, it's it's crazy, crazy what we're seeing unfold in front of our eyes, guys. Like, this is actual, like, straight prophecy by the Prophet Islam, where he said that, that, that ignorance will rise to power and knowledge will be cast out. You're literally seeing it. The professor recording and being arrested? is literally being what it was foretold you know i actually i actually went on a walking spree last night um i blocked 170 celebrities so that was fun <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's the uh you know soprano lights it's an interesting world that we live in in the sense of like i think have become more accessible now but when it comes to i guess social media you, or leveling the playing field to a certain extent that did give the opportunity for everyday people to start saying, okay, now we have other means of influence to uh, assert where we stand uh, when it comes morally, ethically. And, you know, it, it's very interesting because the very unique means of protesting have been done. I mean, who would have ever thought that there would be a mass campaign, a mass campaign to block celebrities who are silent uh but the reality is they make money off of just our views alone and that in and of itself is going to hopefully shake hollywood which is you know such a huge influencer and in, in the way that we uh think about things so fun a lot but one thing i wanted to share and we, i i there are more people watching that i gotta give a shout out to so it's now what from pakistan so i'm from germany from someone who's watching from france let me see if there's anyone london uk Thank you guys all for tuning in and thank you for our moderator who's uh, making sure that no trolls come into the comments um <laughs> when they start spreading their hate but uh, one there's one social ill and i my husband and i speak about it frequently and I, it's a problem on the past uh three years with podcast culture it's become even more apparent that i want to talk about which is i don't even know how to uh, sexual morality hypersexuality um if I had to pick what is the one, if I had to choose one social ill that would be addressed, it would be that one. And mm -hmm. it, it breaks my heart because, subhanAllah, what do you, the harms of sexual immorality are so profound 
in that, first of all, just from a physical perspective, the risks that are associated with that you sleep around, the risk of STDs skyrocket, the risk of, of HIV skyrockets, um, the psychological impacts of it, and then just the spiritual aspect of it, which nobody recognizes, right, is is so harmful in subhanAllah, we are in a day and age where it's being normalized. There was a study that was done several years ago, actually, and it was by the um, family in Youth Institute, which is actually an institute that one of my mentors runs. She's a PhD in psychology, um, and they do basically research around uh, family, youth, in the, the Muslim community in the United States. The stat was that 60% of Muslims have committed zina. 60% have admitted to committing zina. I believe that that's an underrepresentation. There are Muslim people who filled out the survey and didn't, and didn't uh, actually want to admit what they had done. Um, additionally, what about people who didn't commit full bones in them but got super close to it? Because mm -hmm. I then now fast forward to the place that we're in where this is a literally people's identity is based on where they stand, mm -hmm. right? Sexually. Like that's what we've that is the first thing you now come forward with. That's a, the, the 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 face of conversation. Um, we we are we come from a faith that has such strong boundaries around this and oftentimes that was one that's one of the criticisms that non-muslims will have well you know this idea of like it's it's so limiting and it, it treats people like they can't control themselves and the reality is no it treats human beings like people who are worth controlling their desires and not letting their carnal des desires dictate their direction in life and to allow something so intimate to be safeguarded in a place where there is a contract held between a man and a woman under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, there might be some people who break that contract, they'll meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and deal with it, right? If they if they are not brought to justice in this world. But the reality is that there are so many safeguards in something so sacred. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, especially, I mean, from the mothers, you, you, Brother Shai, you were talking about morality and the, 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 you know, lack of morality. Even if you talk about adult entertainment addictions, the fact that this is, I don't know if at this point it's the number one addiction. I remember a, a few years ago when I was looking, it was the, I think it was the second fasting, fastest growing addiction. It probably is the number one addiction now, but um, just the attack on, on men, like psychologically is crazy no. when it comes to this. Yeah, it's it's um it's definitely serious. And then when you start to think about um hijab, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. the purpose of it and and why did it come about, it lessens a lot of drama. So just imagine that all over the world Muslim or non Muslim was covered. You know, and it was less interaction than it is now. So um I think that's definitely a big issue because you have you have people that will come on social media, oh, and they'll complain about this and say, oh, it's two men and it's two women. They not mahram. Why are they on FaceTime? But then the same Muslim, um, he's, he's shaking females' hands at his job and he has coworkers that's females. And it's just a society that we live in that promotes sex out of wedlock, that promotes, you know, you can have four baby mamas, but you can't have two wives and mm. you, know, you can't have three wives but you can have as many kids as you, as you want with as many women as you want and just leave them with no father figure so um it's definitely um crushing crushing the society without a doubt um and that's and that's another reason why a lot of men aren't men you know because they say a female can't raise a man and I've seen some women do a great job, but it's, it's, it's a lot of outside help, you know? So for, for me, yeah, definitely is a, is a serious social illness now. And it's kind of hard to even walk down the street without seeing it, especially where I'm at. I'm in Florida, right? Alhamdulillah, I'm in a real rural area. So we, we, we're seeing cows and goats and stuff like that, right? But if you live in Miami, you're not doing a block a foot and and you know it, the same female that will be outside naked with a bikini but if you know you come over or whatever and and she's not going to be walking around the house you know it's like 
if she's in the wrong panties, it's like, oh, close the door. Yeah. Like, but you was just walking straight down the street on the beach with a bikini. Like, so it's like weird to me. It's like, weird. like you know, but the, the the society we live in promotes that sex sells. And that's just the bottom line, and and it's never gonna it's never gonna stop. It's, 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 it is never gonna stop. Marketing is meant to target what is going to move people the fastest, and when you have literal biological mechanisms that signal in an instant to both men and women, especially to men, uh, that this is something that they want, and you now have to in order to even be able to to control that level of instantaneous, like the, 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 the spike in dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin requires a strong level of discipline, which most people do not have, let alone you know, in a situation in a society that we live in, which literally caters to the left and right. It's it's the easiest way to get people to do what you want to do and, and buy what you want them to buy and submit to certain lifestyles that would make them easier to control and less likely to call out things that are being done, um, that are harmful to society, subhanAllah. One thing, Brother Shay, you, you reminded me, the one thing that I always gets me is occasionally I watch a podcast just like, um, you know, these, these random podcasts where people are talking about just like uh, hookup culture and things of that sort. And I'm just curious to see what people are saying outside of Islam. When I would hear women who would say, marriage is not good for women. Marriage is, marriage is not good for women. And then in my mind, I'm like, baby girl, you're married. But you're just, it's just not on paper. If you live with your boyfriend, you you handle things the way that you would want that would they be handled in a marriage, except he has nothing holding you to. So now when he ups and leaves, you're sitting there one by one, you have no trust in men. But where was the commitment to you in the very first place, right? This right. fact that marriage is supposed to be not only a personal commitment, it is a it is a religious, a religiously instituted commitment, right? If you, sit in front of, and you watch in a cafe being done, there's reminders of have tough love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way you deal with your your you know your your husband or your wife. And then there's also a public commitment where people should know so that the community holds you accountable. It, it was such a powerful institution and then we've rendered it useless because people are just you would rather just hook up. Yeah. Yeah this is quick. If you ever meet a female who's been married in Islam, right? And, and still married or maybe they separated but the man in that relationship i mean took care of everything we're not talking 50 50 60 40 70 30 and sometimes you know in islam you know as as the man my money is your money but her money is her money right mm -hmm. but you know they made it to where a man can't take care of a household nowadays you have to be making ten fifteen thousand dollars a month just to be able to do that so unfortunately in these muslim households we're constantly doing 50 50 60 40. but if you've met a female a woman who's been married and the men took care of every single thing financially and she decided to still work and have her own money it's the best experience for a woman if you just hear her side dealing with that and going through it She'll tell you it was like, yeah, I, I mean, I love it. Like, you know, it's nothing like I'm it. Ready. So, so I, I, what, what <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You know, so if you're dealing with that situation, because it takes so much stress, you got to understand, right? The men can't give birth. So the women are giving birth, right? And we're not saying you wash dishes. But I love washing dishes. That's one of the chores that I love to do. Right, first personally, just personally. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I clean. I'm pretty tidy. I'm, you know, going to prison, dealing with a small cell. You have to make sure things are in order. So now, if you're dealing with a woman that that is having two, three kids, four kids, yo, children are, and then having a nine to five. People don't really understand how much stress that is. If a man can come into that situation as a husband, a provider, and remove the financial responsibility, mm -hmm. it is nothing like it. It is nothing like it. And the society that we live in today, they're making it to where it's not possible. 
that social media is raising your kids. You have to give them a tablet. Go over here I, because there's so much going on. I just came from work. I just did a 12 hour shift as a female. You don't want your females doing a 12 hour shift. If she wants to do it, you know, go ahead. But you don't have to. You know what I'm saying? Because you have this, I have this set up, this account, you can take from this. This is our budget. You have play time, you have fun time, you have, you know, when it's set up like that and the way the society is set up, they're making it they're, they're making it hard. Well they need it. Been, they, been, they need it. Know. They need you on a dual income so they can tax you and make money off of you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Rosie's already Rosie's ready to jump in. Go for it. I, Hold on, before you jump in, let me just give everybody a life hack, right? So the life hack is, uh, especially for you fellas out there, right? Uh, give all your money to your wife because then every time she pays for something, it's up. <laughs> so like, oh, yeah. okay. you know, <laughs> just okay. just keep getting uh, keep it getting that edge, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Brother, well, brother Morris, it's even um, I believe there there are two hadith, one regarding in which a woman gives for her. Um, uh, if she decides to contribute financially to her home, it is counted as sadaqah. Uh, then for men as well, that every I mean everything that you do for your family is sadaqah. Every morsel you, of food you put in your in your wife's mouth and your children's uh, mouth is sadaqah. And subhanAllah, just even when you think about that, uh, Brother Shari, you're talking about how difficult it is to financially uphold a home in the times that we live in, and now we have inflation. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a system of barakah like mm. when my uh when my husband and i got married we were in a very different financial place than we expected some fun about i mean we and we knew why we made the decisions we made we had decided that before getting um before like after nikah and like before moving in so we were stomachly married but we there was about a month or so like before we had actually gotten uh moved in uh, we were just in a payoff our, all our debt. Like our thought is, okay, this is going to run our savings dry. He had student debt, I had student debt. But I would rather the better couple lost pound how to be with us. And then we were in a situation, alhamdulillah, because of the pause, there was no interest on what we had. And we were just like, let's throw the money. And the worries were coming. Well, what about the wedding? And what about this? And I was just like, I remember he surprised me when he paid off all of his. I mean, he was working like 70 hours, this, mashallah, to, 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 to save up for our wedding. And, our, and get our place and pay off the debt and he surprised me and I, then I was able to pay off um mine mm -hmm. I just owe some to my father who at the end of the day he's not gonna he, he's not knocking on the door so I shifted the last bit to my father and just paid off everything that was owed to wow. uh the government wallahi wallahi the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided after that, the barakah that just flowed in, the amount that we got for gifts, the way that I made a du'a, Ya Allah, in every way possible, make this as inexpensive to get married as possible. The deals that we got on the wedding, the wedding, our wedding was beautiful. It was like gorgeous. You would see that and you would literally think this was a $40,000 wedding. Mm. I cannot tell you the places, our photographer who normally charges like 4,500, um, charged like two grand right mm -hmm. the amount of of per plate that you're supposed to pay right typically it's it, uh, the quotes I, I was getting was 32 35 right per plate I randomly call one place which is a beautiful place and it's usually always booked 20 i think she slipped up and said 21 and then later when she tried to say it was higher i was like no you said this and she helped you it <laughs> it saved us so much money i had friends who we're like, oh my God, it's your wedding gift. Let me give you this service, and it. I didn't have to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. It was insane. It was insane. The uh, the uh, bad mm -hmm. yeah. guy just yeah. and it, every time we worried, Allah brought something that brought us more money. Mm -hmm. We had a speaking uh, engagement that that we were uh, we were offered at a time where we were li literally sitting there, and I had uh, my tra my license hadn't transferred yet, so I couldn't start working. And my husband had made it clear he was like, I don't want you contributing to that to the hospital. And I was like, yeah, but like we're struggling this. And he's like, I don't care. Like, oh, I'm gonna figure it out. You don't worry. It might mean that you don't get to see me as often, but I'm going to figure it out. That's and it. he has. He has figured it out. There's never That's been it. a situation. I mean, he literally said this to me the other day. Um there was like a, a milestone that I hit in my in my business, and I was really like excited. I'm like, okay, we have to celebrate this. And so we um we 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 don't like get to go out too much because my husband is just super busy between work and school. So I was like, okay, let's get steak and I'll make it at home and like it'll just be a fun dinner. 
And I didn't realize how darn expensive that stuff was. Yeah. So <laughs> I made the mistake of letting him go in and get it. And then I was like, okay, how much was that? He refused to tell me. And I was like, I didn't want you to have to like shoulder this burden of this, uh, this, you know, a very expensive meal. And he was like, has there been something, has there ever been something that I told you that you said that you wanted that I haven't been able to provide you? I was like, no, there's not been a thing that I've asked for that you haven't been able to give me. It's like, then that's all I need. Allah. Um, it's barakah. It's subhanAllah. Allah will take care of you if you truly want to uphold, uh, if you want to uphold righteousness in a taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of you. And I've, I've not seen that except, except that it came to fruition. Rosie, what were you going to say? Yeah. So yeah. I, I have been, uh, I've experienced it, is it both sides of the coins? I, I don't know, mm-hmm. but I was married before, um, before I converted to, to Islam, um, mm-hmm. well, years before I um, converted to Islam. But it's funny because when I was married prior to Islam, I was the one paying all the stuff, all the like bills in the house. I was the one paying it. Um, my husband at the time had two jobs. Mm-hmm. I only had one and I would pay for everything until once I got pregnant, then I was put on bed rest. And then we even got kicked out of where That's we cool. lived because he wasn't paying anything. And I couldn't work at the time um, since I was on bed rest. Now that I am a Muslim and I am married to a Muslim man, I own three businesses. He works one job. I don't pay a single bill oh, in this house. That's, not, that's, that's the way it's supposed to be. If it can be done, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and like, yeah, okay. he, when I tell you my husband, if I'm cooking, he's doing the dishes. I have never even had to ask him, oh, can you do this? Can you do? He automatically, if he sees me cooking, he goes, oh, he's going to do the dishes. When he left, because he's, he, my husband's on rotation. Or, you know, um, but when he left, the he left things for like the last minute. And so I was like left with like, oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I got it, you know. Rosie, it's breaking up a little bit on your end. And he was like, no, 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 no. When I come back, what was that? You're breaking up a little bit. She's freezing. Yeah, it's freezing. Um, Rosie. Oh. Rosie, try to try to um like turn off your Wi-Fi and turn it back on and then turn it back in and show uh, I will also say that I apologize, but I do have to go here very shortly. No problem. Um, and now that uh, Rosie's husband is on rotation, the dishes are dirty. So this is <laughs> this is a problem. Now. <laughs> um, uh, but this has been a, a very pleasant experience, and I wish I could stay a little bit longer. I do have some commitments. Um, but yeah, we appreciate you. Yeah. Everybody. And uh, I will be subscribing to the calisthenics because that is something I've been really wanting to get into. So oh, yeah. alhamdulillah. Yeah. Uh, rest assured, I will be practicing the things that you are preaching at home because I have a goal to drop about 15 pounds and I need to put on some muscle wow. on top of that. So, uh, yes, but uh, thank you so much for hosting this. And, uh, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to elevate everybody and guide everybody. And uh, anything that I said that was a mistake is purely for me and Shaitan. And uh, anything that is in truth is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Brother Morris, for hopping on. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to let Rosie finish her thought. I think you might still be breaking up, Rosie, and then we'll close off anyways, inshallah. But thank you so much for your time. Oh, looks like- oh no worries. If she's going to, okay, if it's going to be a short close, I'll, I'll try to stick around yeah. for another five minutes or so. Yeah, we'll, we'll close up. Inshallah. Rosie, go ahead. Finish finish your yeah, statement. Uh, and we're gonna close uh, but yeah, no, he, he left. He kind of left me a mess, but I cleaned it all up. But he was like... <laughs> When I get back, when I get back, I'm going to be doing the cleaning for nine months. I was like, great. <laughs> yeah, a lot of and I, I want to make it clear also because there might be brothers here and I don't want them to feel um, discouraged, right? Islam allows for you to decide what is best for your family in terms of financial um, operations. So, you know, mm-hmm. there are some places that are just insanely expensive and it's near impossible to yeah. uphold a, a home with one income. So there's no shame in the sense of if you're not able to do it, 
um, and you come to a, a reasonable agreement, you know, a just agreement with your wife, and, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you in, in the way that you do it. Musa alayhi salam had a, you know, had a certain agreement in the way that he was able to contribute to his family. Um, we have we have those options. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just bless any any Muslim man who takes on and shoulders the responsibility of caring for his home. And, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the doors of risk for those who are struggling financially, especially if it is to care for your to care for your home. Um, I'll end with this, inshallah. You know, subhanAllah, we started off with kind of talking about um, your your conversion stories and then just getting into the way in which Islam touches every aspect of our lives, from our marriages to our discipline to our health to politics. And this is the, the power of the deen is that it just creates this incredible framework through which we operate and see every part of our lives. And in it, right, there's a beautiful hadith I always, always love to reference, and forgive me if I misquote it, but the point still stands that the Prophet Islam said something oh. along the lines of um, everything is good for the believer, and that is not uh, that is not the case except for a believer, right? When he or she is given us uh, something of, of goodness, they are grateful, and that is and that is good. And when they are tested with difficulty, they are patient, and that is good, and that is not the case except for a believer. So we live in this world where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, we are told in, in the Quran to ask for um Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fid akhirat hasana, right? Wa qina adab al nar. Oh Allah give us uh, just pure goodness in this dunya and in the akhirah and protect us from the punishment of hellfire. And that's what we're doing. I mean, everyone here is you guys are not monks or ascetics living like a uh, a hidden life. You're you're doing things that you're passionate about and that you may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in your efforts. Um, there are movements happening in this world, subhanAllah. When we're talking about, you know, um, men and women in the gender wars, now there's this huge femininity movement coming in, yeah. subhanAllah, where women are just like, we're sick of this, stop it, stop it. You guys gave us hormonal issues, and how do you mean diseases when you told us we were supposed to get independence? We didn't sign up for this, right? There are, you know, um, although some are very misplaced, um, movements of just encouraging masculinity and we will need more Muslim men in that space sharing what Islamic prophetic masculinity looks like not what getting cars and girls and this is and that you know um, masculinity looks like so alhamdulillah we're seeing a lot of, of progress in this world and, and what's happening in Gaza is uncovering a lot of truth so I appreciate so much your time and the space that you guys shared with us today thank you so much for spending Saturday for everyone who is watching, drop your salams in the chat. Thank you guys for tuning in. Maybe we can plan another one of these, inshallah, sure. um, sure. if you guys are open to it. Sure. And uh, all of their all of their channels are linked in the description below. You can go subscribe to them. I will see you guys soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.